Oh man, that song. There was once a time where everyone I knew loved Battle of the Planets, but unlike Star Wars, there were no toys or models of the Phoenix. We had to make do with crappy Lego spaceships that barely looked the part. Well, that's about to change. In this episode, we're building the Academy Phoenix from Battle of the Planets, so slip into your tight bird costumes and let's blast right on in. Now, some of you might be wondering, what are you doing? This isn't a 48th prop fighter. It isn't even an airplane. Well, to that I say, it's kind of an airplane. It's got wings, it's got an engine, and oddly for a spaceship anyway, it's got air intakes. Intakes on a spaceship. You know, like most things from the 70s, it's probably best not to ask too many questions and just accept it for what it is including the idea of teenagers flying this thing wearing skin-tight polyester bird costumes with beak helmets. Okay, more on that later, because it gets a bit weird. So, what about this kit? It's New Academy. It is really well molded. It is absolutely excellent to put together. And Academy designed this kit, I think, to appeal to different types of modelers. It's uh, modeled in several colors, and it could be press fit without glue. It uh, can also be glued, and it has stickers in addition to cartograph decals. And most importantly, it goes together pretty, pretty well perfectly. So anyone from a casual fan of the show to a hardcore modeler is going to enjoy this build. And there's a t- couple other things, too. It can be made clean, like I'm going to do, and it can also be made with all of these missiles and little vehicles sticking out of it, and they're press fit as well. And lastly, you can light this thing up. Academy has a lighting kit, and I'll show you uh, during the build how to install that. All right, so what is this thing anyway? The ship is called the Phoenix, and it's from an animated show called Battle of the Planets. At least that's what it was called in North America. It first aired here sometime in the late 1970s, but the show is actually a bit older than that. It first appeared in Japan in 1972 under the very catchy and logical name of Science Ninja Team Gatchaman. Now, I'm no Japanime expert, but I don't think I'd have ever seen this show, redubbed or otherwise, without one seminal era-defining moment. And that would be the release of Star Wars. You see, every producer in the world saw Star Wars for what it was, a golden opportunity to cash in. And one producer secured this series to capture some of that pure Star Wars magic. Never mind that this show didn't look, feel, sound, or even smell like Star Wars. But it had teens. It was in space. There were lasers. And for the 1970s, that was probably good enough. Apparently, the original Gatcha Man was not meant for North American children, and there was some adult-oriented and cultural themes that would have been inappropriate or confusing to young audiences. So, entirely new scripts were made, deleted scenes were replaced by scenes featuring a lovable robot hermit programmed to only shout out obvious information to the team. I'm airbrushing these subcomponents ahead of the build because I wanted to avoid masking them once they were all incorporated in the model, but you can install them and mask afterwards. Or actually, if you wanted to just keep the base colors of the plastic, it would probably be fine too.
Okay, I'm about to show you how I went ahead and soldered something. Probably not the best idea. Let me see. Need a way to protect myself from getting sued. Ah, disclaimers. Yeah, yeah, that should do it. Anyhow, what is a sci-fi model if you can't light it up? Pretty sad, I'd say. And Academy agrees. They've made this separate lighting kit for use with this Phoenix and a different type of Phoenix that they make. It's designed to work with the kit and comes complete with absolutely everything you would need to install it except directions. So I kind of had to play around with it for almost an entire evening to figure out the best way to wire it so that the switch worked. The system is very clever because it operates through metal plates in the stand. Once you put the model on the stand, the switch in the stand will work. The LEDs are all pre-wired and bunched and the model's exhausts have holes to hold the light bulbs in place. So it's pretty foolproof. Okay, back to Battle of the Planets for a minute. The show featured a team of teenaged orphans with some sort of superpowers. And these somewhat whiny teens are charged with, now let me get this right, protecting Earth's galaxy from surprise attack by alien galaxies from beyond space. Beyond space. Now, if you believe in the theory that space is an ever-expanding bubble, do yourself a favor and don't think about what is on the other side of that bubble when you're having a sleepless night. I mean, what's on the other side? Is it nothing? But what is nothing? Can nothing exist until something exists? Battle of the Planets suggests that the, some sort of Geneva Convention ignoring galaxies exist beyond that bubble, and the angsty teens defeat them in every episode. It was the 70s. Okay, so who were these teens? Well, they're the standard TV trope super team. You got the big guy. He has a clever name, Tiny. You got the edgy, maverick, no rules following guy with a boring name, Jason. The girl, dressed in pink, named Princess. Standard stuff. But she had a certain je ne sais. Need to... They had some weird little guy named Keop or some other nonsense. And then there's the leader. Casey Kasem. Seriously, it's Casey Kasem. And I say this because he totally mailed it in. I think he just read the lines quickly between takes of American Top 40. Here, take a listen. I copy, Zark. What's up? Is G-Force already in flight? At least when he did Shaggy, we got some true voice acting, but maybe Battle of the Planets paid scale? It wouldn't surprise me. They cheaped out quite a bit with this production. Anyhow, in each episode, Casey and his gang would be assembled. They'd transmutate into their bird costumes. They'd fight some sort of enemy mecha contraption, in the middle of which they'd find themselves in some sort of pickle. And they would transmutate the ship into something called the Fiery Phoenix. And then the end of the episode was Bad Galaxy Defeated, Fade Out, Roll Credits. That was pretty much it. The Academy Kit's assembly instructions assume that builders are just going to press fit the model together. And there are parts of this model which I did press fit and they went together very well without any gaps or steps. But because I was going to paint it, I had to deviate just slightly from the uh, instructions. And I decided just to be safe, I'd glue my model together. And every part that I glued and fit, 
was actually almost a perfect fit. The only time I had to use any sort of clamping or tape was on this section here. I had to put a little bit of tape just to ensure that I'd have no gap or seam to fill at the end of the build, and uh, I didn't. So what was it about this show? Why does it hold any significance for me, and obviously for many others, for there to be a top-tier injection molded release of the Phoenix some 40 years after Battle of the Planets first aired? That's a hard one to answer. I mean, yes, I watched it because that was really all that was on in the afternoon for kids whose parents shelled out for three-channel basic cable. But I think there's got to be more to it than that. I probably watched it because space was very much a cool topic at the time. Moon landings um, were not all that far in the past, and Star Wars was uh, very much a phenomenon. Space-oriented and space-themed Lego was on the horizon, and I could recall that literally everything you could buy, uh, from pillowcases to lunchboxes, had some sort of space-oriented theme. And I think, really, for some reason, kids just like animated TV shows. Thinking about it, though, these bird costumes, uh, this whole bird motif, I really have no idea what was behind it, except I think it was a tie-in to the fiery phoenix mode of the ship. I suspect there was more of an explanation in the original series in Japan. And maybe it was explained in Battle of the Planets at some point. To be honest, seven-year-old Chris wouldn't have cared. Actually, if anyone watching this video knows or has a theory, please let me know in the comments. I'm actually very curious because, honestly, helmets with plexiglass beaks mixed with narrow workspaces aboard spaceships, I'm just thinking that's not a very good combination. I mean, aside from that beak visor always distorting your vision, I think you'd bash it into a lot of equipment as well. There's got to be some logic. Perhaps maybe it was aerodynamics when they were running. They were always running. It was weird for a show that they were into a spaceship, but they were always running places. If you're interested in the show, there are a surprising amount of them available on YouTube for watching. I actually sat down with my daughter to give one a spin just a few weeks ago. Let's just say she wasn't very interested. I don't blame her. I, I don't think I'd be inter all that interested in seeing my dad's episodes of Howdy Doody either. I found out that there are a number of box sets of the show that have been produced over the years, both in the Gatchaman and in the Battle of the Planets titles. And there's also been a, an actual live action movie that was produced in 2013. I don't know if that was produced in English or not, but again, I saw all this on Amazon and it's all available. There still isn't a lot of Battle of the Planets or Gatchaman toys or models available. There never actually were. And looking back, I don't think that the fact that there were no models of toys was necessarily a bad thing. I remember watching this show with my big box of Lego right beside me, and I'd often try to recreate the ships or machines that I saw on the screen. In my mind's eye, these were perfect recreations, but I'm sure they were blocky, multicolored approximations at best. But hey, at least I was making something, and maybe that's what contributed to my need to make things in plastic today. As you can see during these assembly stages of the model, I am just slamming through this thing. The parts fit almost like a watch. Uh, just a bead of glue is needed. There are no gaps or any issues, any build issues that I ran into. And I just want to, uh, to just bring up that Academy sometimes gets a bit of a, of a bum rap in terms of their quality. 
and I think it's because they still offer a lot of old kits in their catalog but these new Academy kits and I've built a few of them are absolutely fantastic I would stack them up with almost any other current manufacturer at the top of their game today it just makes for a very enjoyable build I decided to go a little different this time for spraying the model and I use Gunzi spray cans. Of course, I warm these up in a bottle warmer before spraying because it just helps the flow and for whatever reason, I think it helps with making the paint go on smoother. And the quality of these spray cans is excellent. I went with bright, a bright blue and a bright red in order to match at least my mind's eye of what the ship looked like on the series and uh, just a couple of coats on each part it comes out high high gloss in both cases and like i said extremely smooth paint very easy to apply you don't have to use a uh, uh, a bottle warmer to get the bottles warm i think that even if you just had a um a container full of hot water out of the tap, put the can in there for a couple minutes, it'd be the same effect. The kit comes with a couple of movable features or posable features. One of them are the wingtips of the ship that you can pose downwards. I think in the show this particular ability of the ship was used a few times. I think it had something to do with flying in an atmosphere. The ends of the wings would droop down. So Academy has made this a posable feature within the, uh, within the model and it works quite well. I tested it a few times. I'm not sure that I would constantly move the wings up and down like that but maybe it works fine and as you'll notice i've already painted the wingtip and that red plate section i couldn't figure out how to paint that all together and have a really nice uh, red plate where that wing tip meets the rest of the, uh, the the aircraft so that's why i painted that first Normally, I am a aircraft modeler, and specifically World War II propeller planes. That's been my interest in this hobby since the time that I came back to it in the early 2000s. Maybe it was the late 2000s. Anyway, I've rarely ventured out of it. Yeah, I've built a tank here, I've built a boat there, that sort of thing. This, this is the only time that I have built a specific sci-fi kit. Um, the, I did make a Blade Runner model some time ago, but it was really more just a car. And I'm not really sure what has kept me away from pursuing more sci-fi kits, except uh, just generally I've been more interested in uh, in aviation that said however if sci-fi kits are, are as good as this one uh, I'm thinking the new Star Wars ones uh, there's some uh, various other uh, they're, they're unfamiliar to me anyway but sort of uh, anime type of model kits out there uh, maybe I should be giving them a try for sure because this one was just a fantastic experience. I, I know I keep saying that, but it truly was. When it comes to putting the last bits of these sub-assemblies together, uh, I really appreciated the effort that Academy put in to them because they had a separate lighting kit and they made engineering tolerances for placing those lights within it and it's a fairly basic add-on kit for the uh, for the lights and sorry for the leds and for the the battery pack but i certainly appreciated the time and effort that they put in to just make it uh, almost a seamless part of the build in fact i don't know why they just don't throw it into the kit itself perhaps it's because it would just make it that much more expensive or 
maybe there's a lot of builders that simply wouldn't be interested in it. As I am applying submit to the nose section, I just wanted to say that along with many other good manufacturers these days, they are doing an excellent job at hiding seam lines within either panel lines or behind other parts that will be installed. This kit is no different. A, a, a great majority of the parts that are cemented on are either cemented on a panel line of some description or otherwise uh, hidden behind another piece that slots into place. So this basically means that with some careful cutting and a very light amount of glue, you will have, uh, certainly I had, no issues with gluing the parts onto the model or even fitting them on and not having to worry about filler or anything like that. So here we go, round two in the paint booth. Once again, I'm using the Gunzi spray cans that I have warmed up in the hot water bath for a few minutes each. And again, I'm doing that so that I get that nice smooth spray. These paints finish with an absolute gloss finish. So it makes it great for applying decals but it's almost a little too distracting to keep on the model afterwards. So after I applied the, the decals, I then used a semi-gloss to tone down a little bit of that shiny finish and make it a little bit more model-like. I think that the real thing would have had a shiny finish to it, and this just this just brings it back to a level that I think is a little more in line with, uh, with a scale model. Now the last bits that I'm painting are the small vehicles that came with the kit that represent the various vehicles that the team members used in order to assemble and, and get into the spaceship. So there's a little motorcycle, a race car, some sort of a all-terrain tracked vehicle, and there's a fighter airplane. These are small, but they are paintable. And the only one that I had a little difficulty in finishing was the fighter plane. And that's basically because A, it's small, like I said, but B, it would require some fairly difficult masking on compound curves and I just had a lot of difficulty getting the uh, getting some Tamiya masking tape to cooperate enough for me to do it. So hopefully I can get that finished at some later time, but I didn't do that at the same time as finishing this spaceship. It may seem like I'm only making fun of the show and the strange era during which it was made. So that begs the question, why on earth did I go out of my way to build this model? Well, for those diehards who have endured my gentle chiding, I apologize. It was all in good fun. I actually like the show, despite how silly it could be. Now, I won't apologize for any of my comments about the 1970s. It was a dark time, malaise, earth tones, horrible fashion and hair. But some good did come out of the 1970s. Not much, but some. And one of those good things was Battle of the Planets. I'm sure every one of us discovered a thing at some point in our youth. Be it Thunderbirds, Star Wars, Transformers, Battlestar Galactica... It really didn't matter what or when because that thing would be unique to each of us. What mattered was the effect our thing had on us when we first discovered it. It made a lifelong impression. And it is forever tied to a point in our life that will always be a happy place for us. So while I'm not a die-hard fan of Battle of the Planets in that I don't own any 4K Blu-ray sets I'm not part of any Gatchaman forums, and I've never owned a bird costume. Battle of the Planets is one of those happy place things for me. 
when I found out about this model, sorry, when I when I actually saw that this model was uh, to be released, I had to get it. And I'm glad that I did. I think a lot of modelers pursue this hobby for various reasons, such as a general interest in aircraft, cars, boats, or armor. Or in my case, an interest in the history of the subject or the era or time and place which the subject existed. And in addition to those reasons, I suspect that making models in and of itself also takes us back to one of those happy places. This was true for me anyway. And it was certainly a great trip down memory lane. And if this ship had, was even a limited run resin kit that required blood, sweat, tears to slay it, I'm sure that I've slayed it and I'd have stuck with it. But I was lucky. The quality of the model itself made for an excellent build experience. And the fact the paint went on so smoothly and the decals worked so well reinforced that. It's just too bad it was released 40 years after the show aired. I'd have killed for this kit back in the day. So at this point in the, in the video, you see that I'm just doing the final assembly of the model and it goes really quickly. Honestly, the subcomponents fit into place. They just click on and I hardly used any glue at this point. And I'm not worried because it is, like I said, it's solid. It's not going to fall apart. Um, the options include leaving it on the base, taking it off the base. You can add the little vehicles and the missiles, like I said earlier. It's, uh, it's really up to you. So am I going to build more sci-fi models in the future? I might. I might. You never know, especially if the quality of kits is up there with this one. I have some Blade Runner kits, uh, cars, and the only thing that's stopping me with those is the, uh, the lighting setup that they require, and, and I'll have to figure out some sort of custom way to do the flashing. Well, thanks for watching and listening. If you like the video and you think others might enjoy it as well, please feel free to subscribe and share. And uh, also let me know what you think of the video in the comments or if you have any memories of Battle of Planets. I'd love to hear from you. All right then, well, until next time, bye for now.